And he could have taken himself signaling by the seesaw. You've got a bit of machinery doing stuff over there. You have another bit of machinery keeping your balance of yourself <laughs> over here. So these will be signals coming in from the CCM genes, and this will be balancing signals from lots of other places within the cell. So, and that maintains the stability of the cell. So if you lose that balance, this is what happens. And this becomes important in thinking about treatment, which I'll do in just a bit. So I'm going to jump across very quickly to think about genetic testing. As a clinical genetics, which is about half my day job, then we test people in two different settings. We test people if they have symptoms. So if you have a cannabis, you may be referred to me to say, can I have a genetic test to find out if this is important for my family? We also do pre-symptomatic testing. You know, my mum and my dad has a familial cerebral cannabis malformation. Can I be tested to see if I'm at risk? And the two are slightly different situations. If you've already got symptoms, finding the gene is really helpful for you for knowing what the risk is, but you already have a condition. If you're at risk, you're a healthy person, you've got your job, then and you're going about your daily life and you don't have to worry about things too much, then you can have a test. The test will not tell you you are at risk of developing a clinical problem. And that in itself is information you need to process carefully before you decide to have that test. The actual test itself, this is Dr. David Beatty, sitting in his office, he's looking tidy and average when I took that photograph. Uh, and this is the old way we used to test the genes. And it's, you can think of it as like reading a book looking for the studies. Uh, but actually, it's like finding a double full stop in the middle of the modern piece. However, you would actually need an electron microscope to see every letter in that copy of one piece. Because it's a topology, it's not a book. So it's really amazing that it was so good when you can sequence every gene in a person. And we can do it from the thousand pounds. But when we do that, we find lots and lots of genetic stuff and we need to know what we're looking for before we go. You have two copies of every gene, and if you have the familiar cellular pattern of malformations, you have a working gene and a gene with a falter. So every time you have a child, it's a 50 50 chance to pass on the faulty copy, they're affected, or the working copy, in which case, they're not affected. We have the added complication with familial cerebral cavernous malformations that you can inherit the gene and never have any symptoms from it during your life. Then, very, very rarely, you might inherit the gene and be affected as a child, although that is really very rare. So, how good, when do we find a familial cause of cerebral cavernous malformations? And the answer is, if you have one lesion and no family history, it's, uh, it's very genetic. I think we never find a genetic mutation causal. <coughs> and that's because what happens is that if you have one or two cells lying in your blood vessel actually have the mutation, but the rest of you doesn't. So that's not important for transmission. If you just have one lesion, the odds of it being a risk in your family are very small to zero. As a genetic I mean, I'm incapable of saying zero just in case, but actually, if you just have one, it's not familiar. But if there are several people in the family confirmed to be affected, we almost always find a mutation. And you may say, well, 80 to 90 percent doesn't sound like all the always to me. But in genetic testing, this is actually the genetic test with the best pickup rate that we run in any other in the UK. 80, that close to 90 percent of the time, you have a lesion, you have a family history, 
we find the mutation that causes them. So um, the remaining 10 to 15 percent are people who have mutations that our machine just does not pick up. If you are one person with several 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 cameras and observations in your brain, then sometimes we find a mutation, sometimes we don't. And the reason for this is that actually what we find is that perhaps half of you has a mutation and the other half of you doesn't. And that seems a bit weird. But every cell in your body has its own construction work. So if half the cells in your body have a fault in that instruction group, but the other half include the ones in your blood, my chest, those, then I don't see the thing that's causing your familial cell damage. So when you see multiple lesions, or you have a lesion and a definite family history, really there's a good cause for testing. If it's just blood, in fact, our pickup rate is so low that we don't recommend testing. <coughs> the one caveat here is children with cerebral cannabis malformations. And this is actually a very small percentage of people who have the gene change. In most families, the children may or may not have the gene change, and they'll grow up absolutely healthy with no symptoms. But it's normal as a parent to be worried about it. In a tiny number of cases, children can present with no damages, but it's really very, very rare. And in that case, it is probably worth considering genetic testing. So if you think about having a genetic test, where should you have one? <laughs> it is that it will be clinically useful. So if you explain your symptoms, if it gives you information, if you find that information helpful, and uh, if it changes treatment. And at the moment, I wouldn't say there's good evidence that it changes treatment. But I think that that is coming, at which point having a test makes sense. But we do have to think that the reasons for and against knowing that you're at risk of developing cameras and operations in the future. If you're a healthy person, you've got a family, you've got a busy job, you know, you need to get on with your life. Do you want this intervention? Will this change anything you do? Will this be helpful for you? And it's important to make that decision with a certain amount of care. So now I'm moving on to the slightly scary territory of looking into the future. So why is there hope for new treatment? And I think that this is a really exciting time in genetics, genetic therapy, we have new therapeutics being developed that will become relevant to CCMs. You know, this is the sort of, this is the bit at the bottom of the radio advert saying, you know, terms and conditions of harm. But at the moment, there is no established disease modifying medical treatment. And I'll profess that when I put down disease modifying treatment, I'm afraid I left surgeons completely out of the equation. So, totally sorry. Because as a physician, I think that I give people tablets and they get a little bit better. And that's what I think of as treatment. But actually, surgery, I think you would say, is in some cases disease modifying. Yeah. So, apologies, I've just left surgeons completely out of the equation. By a part of that <laughs> So, how do you treat? The genetic disorder. And your genes are part of what you are. So, this is a complicated task. You have a set in every cell in your body. Actually, if I took all the DNA in the person and stretched it end to end, it would go beyond Pluto. And somehow I have to find a way of changing those genes as an effective therapy. So, we'll go back. So I have And if you look at it, there are three places that we could have treatment. So the first one, conventional treatment, <laughs> is, so you can tell I'm actually in Yorkshire, even though my accent doesn't sound too much like it. You find a drug that has a direct effect on this protein, this machine. You know, it makes your machine work slightly better. And you know, 
So this is an event, and I'm very interested to see you're going to hear about Hannibal today, because, <coughs> in fact, this is an interest that's actually very active in terms of controlling how well does this work. This may not be the compound, but there are likely to be compounds that reduce the risk of several cannabis operations developing. So this is like a conventional time. I found a drug that affects the machine that's not working well. And we actually we have good examples, not in cerebral cannabis malformations, but in another disease I work with, which is hereditary hemorrhagic geomectasia, or HHT for short, because I need to finish the middle of two in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Four minutes, okay. I'll start to speak with my own speed. Um, and we you know that we can actually treat these with a systemic therapy that affects blood vessels. You can edit your DNA, and this works too, but it's much better for adding genes back in than it is for correcting spelling mistakes for various reasons. But the fun one is actually finding that you can fix your RNA message. You can actually improve the message that comes from the gene. And this is why the CECL concept becomes important. Because if CCM is pushed down here, then there's a balancing signal that keeps everything happy and in homeostasis, if you like. So you lose your CCM signal and your balancing signal takes over. And you can add an RNA therapy, you can change the message so that actually that balance comes back closer to normal. Does this work? And again, different disease. This is spinal muscular atrophy. This is a boy with a more severe fall. He would have died before he was six months of age. But by actually introducing a therapy to his brain or spinal cord, uh, called mucinericin, doesn't drop tongue, then he actually has normal bones to develop. Although he does have some you know, remaining medical issues, we can get RNAs in there, we can affect the way genes work, we can have a dramatic clinical error. How can we be ready for this stuff? How can the CCM community be ready to actually develop or help develop new treatments to support it. The first thing is it actually has to be on the pharma company agenda. If a pharmaceutical company doesn't know about it, doesn't appreciate it, and I hate to say this as a potentially popular making zone, then they will be less interested in it. Then what we have found is that patient communities and patient registers you need to actually understand the natural history so you can develop the clinical trials. You need to know what we should be looking for, what scans tell us that this drug is having an effect, the progression is slower, or things are getting better, or at least not getting worse. And then once you have a big register of people, these are the people you phone up and say, hey, there's a clinical trial, do you want to be part of it? So the registers that should not be underestimated, they sound a bit dull in search terms, but they're absolutely essential in getting stuff working. And I'm going to cite the enrolled HD study. 18,682 patients recruited in the past seven years. Worldwide, rare disease, Huntington's disease, about 1 in 10,000 people. It's not dissimilar in incidence to capital. It's given us a clear picture of clinical progression. We understand the disease process better. We've actually got the first clinical studies starting, but this is a function of the whole world working together. And there was a lot of funding and effort has gone in from a big organization to get it together. How long does it take? I'll just flip through this. But this is also reflects my life in genetics. 1991, I was seeing a patient, Professor Sir John Burke. And he said, don't worry, you may have this condition, but there will be a treatment in 10 years' time. And this was Huntington's disease. And mouse well published, there's optimism, then I'm afraid I went to a skeptical patch, uh, and then 
we've now started the first clinical trials, which I think, when I was in my sceptical moments, I would have felt we might never have seen. And these are agents that have real therapeutic problems. How long does it take? <coughs> HD, which is almost the first one in this domain, took about 25 years. But I think there are shortcuts and lessons from things like HD that could make it short. So my take home message is we can test the genetic causes of familial CCO. There's a theoretical framework for developing treatment. There are things that can be done now that are very much in the domain of CA UK and the Andrew Alliance, so it's great to see Polly here, that will push these things forward, but they need resource and effort from different directions. There's currently no disease logical management, but I think there is hope that one will be developed. And if it works for FCCO, familial disease, it may also work for high sensitivity because a lot of them will have the same genetic basis, but just on one cell level, rather than a whole person. Our clinical trials are starting, but it's a while before those filter down to treatment that we know works. So having one over the better way, I'll tell you sorry. Well, that's not too bad for me. I'm under 10%. Excellent. I'll stop that.